Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isfran, and with me today is author and founder of the Guiding Lights Network, Eric Liu. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Heather. Great to be here. Among many other things, you're an author, uh, you are a civic entrepreneur, and uh, you're the, the founder of Guiding Lights Network. Can you talk a little bit about each of those things? Uh, you bet. Um, so I'm the author of several books, uh, most recently a book uh, that I co-wrote uh, uh, called Imagination First. And it's a book of practices for how people in all different walks of life go about cultivating their imagination uh, and really just practicing uh, how they think more openly about what's possible. And um, we'll talk more about that, but that's a book that um, itself grew out of a, a different book that I wrote called Guiding Lights. And Guiding Lights was a book about great life-changing mentors, teachers, coaches from all different walks. Um, and what it was that made them so powerful and transformative. And uh, Guiding Lights, spending all this time with these remarkable uh, mentors, teachers, and coaches really cracked open for me the fact that at the end of the day, any great Guiding Light, what they're doing is they're opening up your sense of imagination of what you can do, of what you could be, of which way you could go. Um, and so it was a very natural evolution from that one project uh, to the current one around uh, imagination. Um, Guiding Lights itself, um, which uh, was published a number of years ago, yielded this organization that now exists called the Guiding Lights Network. And we work all around the country uh, to promote the art of mentorship, to promote the ways in which imagination as a practice is core to life and work and, uh, and play. And uh, one of the things we do is just work with organizations like uh, yours here uh, to really embed this idea that imagination matters and it's not just a thing that's sprinkled on some and not on others. It's something that everybody can develop uh, just like a muscle with some practice. Well, as you know, the center and our audience has, they're consisting of mainly very crusty and hardened first responders, public safety officials, and people who deal with the facts and people who deal with what is. So tell me about imagination and what it is. In, in that light? That's a great question. Um, we define imagination as simply the capacity to conceive of what is not. And you might think, I mean, anybody might think, not just your crusty first responders, you know, um, that, oh, imagination, it's this kind of frou-frou topic, and oh, it's nice to have over here, but it's not my main focus, you know. I'm not one of those imagination types, right? That's a, a thing that you might think. And particularly in the realm of homeland defense and security, um, that couldn't be more wrong. I think actually the core of the work in this realm is imagination because when you're thinking about trying to anticipate new threats, anticipate different kinds of challenges that might come down the road, think about how um, when a situation arises that doesn't really fit into your preconceived silos of how org charts or bureaucracies or um, the rest ought to unfold, all of that requires imagination. All of it requires a nimbleness of heart and head uh, that says, you know what, I'm going to try to put together the pieces in a different way. I'm going to try to connect the dots in a different way. And so when you say that people in the realm of um, Homeland Security work, in the, you know, work with facts and what is, uh, that's true. But I think so much of how we interpret facts and put the pieces together and go from what is to what if or how it is that we got to what is, um, all of that is work that uh, is centrally about imagination. And the more you can cultivate that capacity, that willingness, and some of it is cognitive, just really thinking around the corner and uh, anticipating uh, different outcomes and possibilities. And some of it, frankly, is just psychological. Like, are you willing to go there, mm -hmm. right? Are you willing to imagine a situation that isn't what you're really used to and isn't your routine? It's not comfortable, but boy, you shouldn't be in Homeland Security work if all you want is just comfort and predictability. That's right. Well, one of the things I really liked among many in the book is the ability to look at fear and how we operate in fear. And how can you imagine, you know, all these things happening and when you might be fearful of your organizational structure just to begin with, you Boy, know. That's another having, great question. Having, you know, imagination to get outside of that organizational structure. And then uh, the bigger picture of, you know, perhaps the fear of getting hit. And, and how do you surmount those? How, how do you participate in imagination that way? Mm, great question. You know, uh, my my co-author of this book, a guy named Scott Noppy Brandon, and I, we, we say that there are basically two big enemies of imagination. Uh, w one is fear, and the other is expert knowledge. Ah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Um, you know, expert knowledge being, you know, when, when you think you know it all already, you don't bother trying to imagine what else there might be out there, right, if you think you've got it figured out. 
But the fear piece, I think, is encompassing, right? Because sometimes it's fear of failure. Uh, sometimes it's fear of success, right? Boy, if we do this right, then people are going to expect us to keep doing this right, right? <laughs> um, sometimes it's just fear of the unknown, and sometimes it's fear of the known. But the, the main thing as a, as a meta practice is just getting yourself individually and yourselves institutionally and collectively able and willing to just step outside yourself and look at the fear, right? What, and just behold it like an object. What is it that I or we operate in fear of? Right? right? Do we within this bureaucracy? Do we operate in fear of taking risk and getting our our, our necks chopped off? Do we operate in fear of um, you know spending money on something when um, it's not clear that there's a direct obvious threat at this moment? Right? Um, and naming them in the first place, I think, is is step one uh, because every organization, I don't care what scale it is, if it's a, a local police department or the Department of Homeland Security, we have a culture, right? And that culture sometimes has a lot of great things, but it often has a whole map of what people think is permissible, but they never say it, right? Right. Um, and being able and willing to say it and name it in the first place is number one, right? Uh, but the number two thing, I think, is recognizing once you've named the things that we as a group or institution are fearful of, uh, is asking ourselves, in what ways is that fear serving us? Is it serving us well or serving us ill, right? Sometimes different kinds of fear, whether, you know, of the kinds that I'm describing, can serve you well because it keeps you on your toes. But more often, particularly in bureaucratic organizations, it serves you ill because it narrows your sense of possibility, it makes you more risk averse, it makes you less tolerant um, of trying things that are outside the box, right? Uh, and so, again, asking yourself, is this fear adaptive or non-adaptive? Mm. Like, to me, that's a simple question. You are either in an organization that is continuously evolving or one that is dying. Right? And evolution requires adaptation. If you are not adapting to, even at the smallest levels, new ways that you know, potential threats are coming at you or new ways that new opportunities could be opening up to, to get ahead of a curve, um, then you're not, um, you're not doing your job. Right? And so imagination requires fundamentally that um, you, you face these fears. The book Imagination First, we draw 28 and a half practices from all these different realms uh, from uh, the, politic, the world of politics, diplomacy, the military, uh, but also the arts, sciences, education, parenting, uh, you name it. And you, know, you realize when you spend a little bit of time connecting these dots that it's all kind of the same thing, right? The vocabulary that someone uses who's a hardcore first responder might be totally different from the way that you know, an early childhood educator uh, might talk about stuff. But in the end, the same questions arise about how do you frame up the sense of what's possible, and how do you expand that frame of what's possible? And some of the practices that we talk about in the book are all about really being aware of the story that you're telling over and over again. Because stories can help shape us, but they also can imprison us, right? And that story can be about, oh, I'm not one of those guys who does this. I'm a, I'm a small, I'm a details guy, not a big picture guy, right. right? Well, that's a very imprisoning story you're telling about yourself, right? And if you take it up one scale, oh, our, our department, you know, we clean up messes, but we don't really think ahead about the future, right? If that's a story you're telling, then that is not adaptive, right? Um, and so being able to look at the stories you tell uh, and what the map is of, uh, of fear and hope that shapes those stories is pretty critical. So talk about a little bit more about the imagination, creativity, and innovation, the ICI yeah. continuum, if you will. Yeah, so uh, earlier I said that we define imagination as this capacity to conceive of what is not, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of times in American life, at least, we use these words interchangeably, imagination, creativity, innovation, right? And particularly innovation, um, Americans love to worship at the altar of innovation. We want innovation now, instantly, we prize it, whether you're in the business world, in government, in education. And our argument is that these three things aren't exactly interchangeable. They're all connected, but you know, imagination is the foundation. It's what comes first. It's why we called our book Imagination First, right? You first have to be able, both, again, intellectually and emotionally, to go there and to ask what if and to conceive of what isn't yet, right? Imagination applied, in some ways, creativity, right? If you do something with that conception, that's creativity. And then only some subset, some small subset of creative acts, if they advance the form somehow, are innovations, right? And so it's this real pipeline. And, you know, to use a very simple thing, I mean, I, I have a daughter who's in middle school. If my daughter conceives of 
a new way to draw a plant or a table or something, a flower, um, she's exercising imagination, right? A, a way that hasn't yet, doesn't exist on earth, right? But it's not till she actually sits down and puts crayon to paper that she's exercising creativity, right? right? And then she draws that picture and then it's only, I mean, as lovely as a picture as it may be, that picture is only an innovation if it somehow really has changed the form of pictures of flowers, right? If it's some kind of Picasso type innovation in the way you do form and function within an image like that. And so that continuum is, it just helps you clarify what you mean when you're talking about stuff. And it also clarifies that if you want an organization that thrives on innovation, the way that the center talks about doing, the way that other organizations do, then you have to pay attention first to imagination. So for folks who are just interested that have heard this podcast and are just maybe putting a toe in the water to say, you know, I might want to look at that a little deeper, but then, you know, not having done it before, how would you recommend they start? I think one of the simplest things that people could do who are watching our conversation right now mm -hmm. is just decide, you know what, next chance I get, might be at a staff meeting, might be at a lunch break, um, I'm just going to lean forward and take a little risk and start a conversation about imagination. I'm going to start that conversation and say, you know, I was thinking, guys, you know, in our work, like so much of what we do depends on us being imaginative and, and thinking about things coming down the pike, but we don't actually talk about that that much. And maybe it'd be useful for us just to spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes talking about what do you do to kind of keep your, those muscles toned and fit for you, right? Because imagination is a muscle. It's not this, people have this conception that it's, you know, it's this entity that either you got it or you don't. Right. Right. And that's one of the myths that we try to bust right through in this book. Every single one of us, every single one of us is born with this capacity. And the only question is, how much are you willing and able to raise your game? How much are you willing and able through practice and exercise to strengthen that muscle? Every child born on earth is born with a deep, deep capacity for imagination. W what is learning how to be a human except the exercise of imagination, right? But mm -hmm. as we become older uh, and we get professionalized and we go into large organizations, that gets a little bit kind of drawn out of us, right? And part of what we have to do is be intentional. You know, this is, a, this is so much about a, a, a practice of intentionality and paying attention to the fact that you got this and you got to exercise it, right? And so I would just encourage people to take that little risk and, and uh, either formally or informally start a conversation about the ways in which imagination plays out in your work and your life. And I think you'll be surprised. People, once, once people get permission mm -hmm. to talk about this topic, it, stuff starts pouring out, right? I don't care how hardcore, hard-bitten you are. I mean, I've led these kinds of conversations on Marine Corps bases, you know? Um, uh, at Marine Corps Officer Candidate School. You know, I mean, you're talking about some, right. some gung-ho people, right? <laughs> Um, and, uh, and it might take just a beat for them to get that this is a conversation that they can take part in. And once they do, the floodgates open, right? They, they start telling stories about a tactical situation uh, in Iraq or in Afghanistan. They start talking about a training scenario at officer candidate school or at Paris Island or at boot camp or whatever. And they start talking about all these ways in which, you know, in the Marine Corps, just to pick one institution, they're not looking to stamp out robots and just, you know, cadre after cadre of robots. They want people who can be thrown into small unit situations and take initiative and figure it out, right? right? And if that's what you want, and if that's what you say you want, then it doesn't happen by magic. It happens because you are intentional about creating a regimen where people exercise that muscle. Um, and I would say that, you know, if anybody's watching us right now, They've already taken one step. They're leaning forward, right? right. They're, they know about the center. They're trying to be learn, lifelong learners and to raise their game in general, right? Now I think that it's take the next step and connect others to it. Right. The, the practice of imagination, like imagination itself, is this great network. It's all about thinking in networked horizontal terms. It's not about hierarchy and permission. It's about who can I connect with, how can I connect, and how can I make this idea light up something over here and get that guy over there to see that he's connected to, over, to this person over here. And the more we can operate in that way, um, the more we will, I think, have a, a wider field of possibility and be able to do our jobs better. I think step number one is really to inventory and listen to the stories we tell about ourselves. Just like you identified with me, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. and, and practicing that helps with the muscle, I, I would imagine, as well. Yeah, and w one of the ways in which uh, we wrote this book, Imagination First, was to make it easy for people to take that kind of inventory, right? 
as you're reading through these practices, you realize, oh, I kind of do this already, or well, that, that's sort of what I do in a different part of my life, right? right. And, and often, we, again, we create these false boxes, right? Oh, I do this in the life where I'm coaching soccer, but not in my work life. You know, <laughs> or I do this when I'm parenting, but not here, right? And um, again, breaking down those walls and getting you to see that these, these ways of being um, are, are really consistent across all the different identities that, uh, that we have. Well, thank you for helping us all step up our game today. It was a great conversation. Time.